happy to introduce Dr. David Masipus today as our speaker. Dave received his PhD at the University of Connecticut and then did his postdoctoral training with Rafi Ahmed at Emory University and was recruited here to the Department of Microbiology and Immunology um, in about 10 years ago and has risen through the ranks to full professor. Um, Dave has had really an incredibly productive career. If you look through his CV, he has tons of publications and Amazingly, an amazing number of them are in the sort of soil science and nature um, type journals, which I think really is a tribute to the fact that his work is really highly regarded as innovative and field defining. Um, he's also won a number of awards, I won't go through them all, many internal and external awards. Notably, he was named last year as an HHMI faculty scholar, so again, a tribute to the innovative, really high impact nature of his work. <coughs> Um, he's, his research interests focus on memory T cells. Um, he's worked early on in his career. He developed a novel boosting method to enhance responses of memory uh, T cells to vaccination, which has um, been widely employed, and, and they're currently working on uh, developing this in the human realm. He also has been working on resident memory C8 T cells, which we'll hear about today. And a couple of years ago, he published a really beautiful cell paper defining these populations within non-lymphoid tissues. Um, he gave a talk a few months ago in our Breast Cancer Translational Working Group talking about the potential of studying these cells and um, their potential for therapeutic strategies in cancer, which I thought was a really cool concept. So I thought it'd be great to have him come and give, give us a talk on his work. Thanks for agreeing to well, thanks very much, Caleb. Thanks for and, uh, it's, it's really great to be here. So uh, I'm going to focus today on uh, some of our work on resident memory T cells. So this is a, a fairly recently emerged concept. I mean, it's something we've been talking about for the last 15 years, but it has been really widely accepted probably in the last six. Um, and because you're not all immunologists, I'm going to begin with a, a very gentle introduction. I don't want to insult anyone with the first slide, but it's just a review to, to put us all on the same page. And so I'll just remind you that I'm going to focus on CD8 T cells. This is a, a key feature of the adaptive immune system. And the, the cardinal properties of the adaptive immune system, of course, specificity in memory. So when I say specificity, you know, if you have a CD8 T cell specific for flu and you get Ebola, you're going to need a different CD8 T cell. And because the microbial world is diverse and always evolving, we essentially have to make a, a million different CD8 T cells that are preformed that could be specific for sort of any microbe that we're going to encounter in our life. The problem with that system is one of that, that diversity means that the abundance of each CD8 T cell for a given specificity is very scarce. And so let's say this is our, our flu infection example. You get flu for the first time in your life, the abundance of those flu specific cells are vanishingly rare. And so what has to happen is these, what we would refer to as naive cells, have to become numerically irrelevant. So that infection is going to trigger really a remarkable program of proliferation. These cells will accumulate 20 divisions, probably at a rate of a single division every six hours, which is astonishing from a mammalian cell. And that's coupled with differentiation to what we call effectors. So now they're armed with sort of mechanisms to fight that infection. Now, hopefully, we live to, to fight another day, and that flu is clear. Well, we're going to lose most of that expanded population, but the magic here of the adaptive immune system is we don't lose all of them. <clears throat> so a subset of fraction survives. It's what we refer to as a memory cell. And we, in fact, the host retains a greater clonal abundance of those cells that participate in the response. So this is what we refer to at the host level as an immunological memory, an increase in quantity. And the point that I'll focus on today is it's actually a lot more complex than that. So there are other properties that change with immunological experience. And the one I'm really going to focus on is a broadening of the anatomic distribution. So, again, the abundance of naive cells specific for infection that you haven't seen is very low. And so those cells aren't attempting to scan all 40 trillion cells in your body directly. Rather, they're limiting their immune surveillance to secondary lymphoid organs, such as lymph nodes, and they're doing so through a program of recirculation. It's using blood and lymph as a conduit. So you can observe these cells in blood. And in fact, this migration program has been appreciated really for over, over 50 years now. Now, if you get an infection, I put it here at the big toe, well, essentially, you have to wait for the infection or the pathogen-derived material to come to the T cell, to drain to that draining lymph node, to allow these cells to get triggered 
to then undergo and execute this proliferation program, the differentiation. And importantly here, what I want to emphasize is they have to migrate. They have to go to the rest of the body because basically if you're a CD8 T cell, I should mention, the job is, you know, you're tactile, you want to survey host cells and interrogate whether they're harboring that intracellular infection. In this case, we have a productive recognition event, and so uh, that's resulted in cytolysis, one of the, the cardinal features of these cells. And where I became very interested, uh, really stemming from graduate work, is the appreciation that the memory population, which is more clonally bonded, that remains long after that infection has gone away, <coughs> remains broadly distributed. So they can be isolated from lymph nodes or blood like their main counterparts, but you can also isolate these memory cells from mucosal tissues, from barrier sites, that would include the skin, from solid organs. And this sort of triggered at the time or helped feed into a reconceptualization of how sort of the T cell immunosurveillance was working. And people started to envision that T cells belong to different subsets, which they do, that can be parsed based on their migration properties and based on how we think they would participate in the event of a reinfection. And so, for instance, there are flavors of T cells that are patrolling these non lymphoid sites, let's say a mucosal barrier. And if you have a local reinfection, well, anatomically, these cells would be positioned at that site for more immediate recognition. And if we look transcriptionally, or at the protein level, these cells often are poised for more rapid execution of effective functions. Now, that may contain the infection on site. If that system fails you, or if it's lacking, and you have a, a secondary antigen exposure, and you get antigen into the deeper recess of the body, <coughs> well, you have different flavors of T cells patrolling those lymph nodes that are poised for proliferation to differentiate into those, that army of effectors that can then migrate where you need. So that's the basic thinking, and uh, sort of a predominant paradigm for some years was just as we understood that cells were recirculating from blood to lymph nodes through lymph, it was envisioned that you know, the naive cells are doing that, the memory cells are doing that too. And uh, so that you would have flavors of memory cells that go from blood into lymph nodes, and perhaps different flavors of memory cells that would migrate into, let's say, the intestinal mucosa. They would look around for pathogen, they'd exit via the lymphatics, they get back into the blood, and then repeat that migration pattern. The convenience of that, from a, a clinical point of view, is you can study in peripheral immunosurveillance just by sampling blood. The reality, which has become abundantly clear over the last few years, is this model really fails to capture a lot of the complexity and a lot of the immune system is not being sampled this way. And the, the one issue that I'll focus up most on today is this issue of resident memory and non-lymphoid tissues. And so, this is well vetted, it's well accepted now. I'm just going to introduce the concept with a single uh, defining experiment. So we have a mouse here. We've exposed it to something called LCMV, lymphocytic meningitis virus. Really not important for our purposes other than to say this infection is clear within about a week. And it results in the establishment of this virus-specific memory population being established in, in lymph nodes, in spleen, and in blood, and in the 20 non-lymphoid tissues we've looked at. And then we have naive mice, which of course don't have LCMV-specific memories because they haven't seen LCMV. And we can join the vasculature of these mice. This is a surgery known as parabiosis. You, you may be familiar with it. But bottom line is this is a test of recirculation uh, because they share a blood supply. So say you are a memory T cell. You're in the spleen. You relieve the spleen and use blood as a conduit to migrate back into that spleen. You're going to equilibrate between the spleens of these two mice. And so the question we're asking is, you know, how much does that really occur, and how might that vary in different anatomic compartments? So on the left, we're in spleen, and, and one gets the expected result. So this is our immune parabion. They used to have twice as many memory T cells, as you see here, but they've been diluted because they're in equilibration. They've been shared because they're trafficking through the blood with the spleen of the naive mouse. But if you look at a tissue such as the female reproductive tract, which is abbreviated FRT, you, you don't see that equilibration. So essentially, these cells were parked within the tissue, or what we refer to as being resident. And 
if you canvas a broader array of tissues and you graph the proportion that are resident or parked within the tissue, you can see this feature isn't unique to the female reproductive tract, but it dominates the non-lymphoid compartments. Now, if you look at the small intestine, whether you're in the epithelium, the underlying lymph appropriate, essentially 100% of our acute virus-specific memory cells in that compartment are parked there. They're not recirculating. You'll never see them in blood. And that's true or mostly true as we go on down the list until we get to you know, lymph node or spleen, which of course has memory cells. Most of those are recirculating, so they're not coming up on this graph. A story that we have under revision now investigates how we can generate residents within very specific lymph nodes. It's not a story I'll, I'll go into today, but I will say that you know th this is uh, a picture following primary acute infection in SPF mice. The general model that's emerged from all this is as such. So yes, you know, naive cells are primed in secondary lymphoid organs, let's say a lymph node, they proliferate. But those daughter cells that marginate out into non-lymphoid <coughs> tissues, or at least a relevant fraction of them, are going to undergo site-specific changes post-migration in the tissue and become part within that site. Again, we call them residents, and we typically abbreviate that TRM for T resident memory to really establish them as a, as a discrete lineage from the kinds of cells that you will see in blood because they are quite distinct in terms of as, at the transcriptional level uh, in terms of the transcription factors that are thought to be driving these sort of programs. But I do want to emphasize that you can't study these cells in blood, they're in the tissue. You have different populations of cells controlling the blood and it does raise a lot of interesting questions about immune surveillance and in the event of a reinfection, how you really integrate these different populations to promote protective immunity. And I don't want to get very granular with this talk, so the, the simple points I'll make with this busy slide is that a, a, I think a, a model, it's a work in progress, but that the tissue itself is providing inductive cues. So if you're a T cell and you migrate to, to location X, you're going to listen to that environment. And you're going to make adaptations to survive within that compartment you may make actually choices about what effector functions are compatible with the physiology of the organism, but still optimal for protective immunity. I'm giving a little bit of artistic license here. I won't go into the molecular mechanisms that have been defined. There's a lot more work to be done. But I would say that these resident memory cells certainly look different than what you will see in blood. And that they are heterogeneous. And so it's going to depend on certainly different anatomic compartments. Those cells may have different properties. And obviously, the stimulation history of the cell uh, will be relevant as well. All right. How I think about this, this, this phenomenon of resonance is as a mechanism by which the host can regionalize immunosurveillance. So say you, you got big toe infection. Well, you can bias your immune surveillance to that big toe. And in fact, you don't have to accomplish that with a big toe-specific recirculation program. I think was really the predominant wisdom for some time. But you could just simply park more cells there. And I think that's probably the dominant mechanism uh, that we use. All right, so I'm going to focus mostly on resident memory today, but I'm going to make a, an unusual departure. Something I don't talk about too often. Um, but I'm glad Sarah Hamilton's here, who's been a part of this story. So. So I'll introduce it this way. And I'm hoping you're going to, by the end of the talk, you're going to really love resident memory. And you're going to run out the door and want to study it. Um, and you're a doctor, so you probably are going to study this in humans. But maybe you're like me and, and they're just a mouse doctor. And then you're going to be angry with me, perhaps. So I've induced these cells because I've infected those mice with LCMV. But if I just order a mouse to the University of Minnesota from Jackson Labs, that's what my non-lymphoid tissues are, are going to look like, or most of them, when we're standing for CD8 and pain. You don't see anything here. And that was actually quite disquieting. Uh, if you look in a human, there's abundant CD8 T cells and tissues. These resident memories, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go into that, are remarkably abundant. If we try to isolate them and get them onto a flow cytometer, typically we lose a lot of them. We may lose 90%, we may lose 98%. And there are survival issues. Uh, going on there that I won't go into. So they're abundant, but they're, they're almost absent from, from the tissues of, of the lab mice that we purchase, most of those tissues. And this resonated with something, really an observation back when I was a, a postdoc, 
again, it was a mouse doctor. I had an opportunity to uh, interrogate human blood alongside mouse blood. And I was just looking at CDA T cells because that's what I study. And if you were to look at the top row here, so we're profiling these cells with different markers, flow cytometrically. Won't go into it too much, but uh, in pink, what's being highlighted are what we would refer to as a memory cell in the two different species. Humans have a few more than mice. They're more abundant. But what got me concerned is when you gate on these populations, now they look very different between the species. So humans have more you know, C27 low cells, more green B positive cells. We interpret this as being uh, a more differentiated cell. Mice, essentially, you order them, they don't have them. And this is a very narrow prism. I don't want to over you know, generalize this. But just by these markers, we're also looking at human cord blood. And the mouse looked more like that in terms of, of the, the flavors of CD8s we were seeing in the blood. And so, you know, this sort of touched this core, this debate that's been going on for, for long before uh, I've been an immunologist, but in terms of the relevance of the mouse model to human immunology, uh, you could extend that to other fields as well. This was a paper that, that came out a, a few years ago. I won't go into the, sort of the details at all. It's purporting to say that the transcriptional response to steroid inflammation was, was very different between mouse and humans. I will emphasize that uh, the politically charged point was that you know maybe we maybe the mouse model isn't so good, and we needed to do a whole lot more human immunology. And uh, people were, were paying attention. And there's uh, again, this is this has been a pretty vocal debate for some time. And so, without getting into that, it, it does at least push one for some introspection. You know, there are differences between mice and humans. There are also incredible value to the mouse model uh, in terms of manipulation, in terms of ethical considerations, in terms of the incredible toolbox that's grown around it, the experimental power. And so the spirit of this is, is there a capacity to make changes to the mouse model that in some set of, of circumstances might be an improvement? You know, can we think about how we're doing things a little bit? So that's all uh, we're coming at this with, and we certainly didn't know where this was going to go. But the first question we asked is, is this an issue truly common to all mice? You know, is this 150 million years of species divergence? And we'll never know. Oh, we will. No. Nope. Bring me back to my chalk talk days. All right. <laughs> so, you know, initially, uh, Bob Magis, who's now a professor here, and myself went out to the barn, we went out to the pet store, uh, and we looked at, at what those mice look like. And, and later on with uh, Carrie Casey, a postdoc, and then uh, this is a, a project that has evolved, and I'll get to the more modern data. The bottom line here, if you go to the pet shop or you go to your, your basement, those mice are going to look different. This is our lab mouse. This is what those mice look like. Without getting into the markers, you can see they're different. There's a, an expansion of cells that we would refer to as memory or antigen experience and that are, are differentiated. And you know, express markers like they're more low for C27, more high for granzyme B, like we had seen in, in humans. And so the question is, you know, why is this? <laughs> All kinds of technical hazards for you. <laughs> so, uh, Inspiration, this really paper just came out a year ago, but it got us thinking about environment. So this is a paper by Mark Davis and Sal, who basically, uh, it was a twin study, and <coughs> concluded that a lot of the variation from one human to another in the immune system is actually non-heritable, i.e. driven by the environment. And so when we consider the environment of our mice, uh, well, they're called SBF, that means specific pathogen free, and the definition varies from one institution to another, but essentially at the vendor, these mice that we purchase are being screened for sort of all your common mouse pathogens, and they're free of those. And then when they get to Minnesota, they go in these boxes, and they live, you know, basically in a micro-isolator, uh, you change the cages in a, you know, in a biosafety cabinet, clean food, clean water, the whole nine yards. And so you are doing everything in your power to keep common mouse pathogens out of that, that colony. And that obviously isn't, isn't how <laughs> we live our lives. So, the, to, to interrogate whether this made a difference, you know, required uh, us to sort of step up in terms of uh, 
the facility requirements. We we're very lucky that a BSL-3 uh, was built, uh, actually, in our building over in WMDB. Um, so Leeds Postdoc in my lab, Steve Jamison, uh, is a, a PI, our next door neighbor, along with Sarah Hamilton, another PI, and then Biovigis. And the experiment was this. Just to take our lab mice and drop a pet store mouse in that cage, we're doing BSL-3 because no one wants a dirty pet store mouse anywhere near their clean mouse colony. Uh, and we don't want to get in trouble for that either. So uh, we're not trying to protect ourselves, we're protecting the, the rest of the mice at the university. What happens? This is our before picture. Commotion in the blood, just by dropping a pet store mouse. Uh, that lab mouse is, undergoes a lot of changes. After a couple of months, these things settle down, they quiet down, but the mouse's immune system never goes back to what it was before. So for instance, it's maintaining an elevated quantity of differentiated CD8 T cells. And this is coincident with a lot of pathogens are moving over from that pet store mouse uh, to the lab mouse. Uh, there are changes in the microbiota, um, and the immune system changes extend way beyond CD8. So we're focused on CD8s, but your uh, you know different flavors of, of CD4 T cells or innate lymphoid cells or and so on. Your B cells, your germinal centers, your plasma cells have all undergone changes in response to this environmental change. You now your titers of class switch antibodies are increased in pet store mice and that gets transmuted to the lab mouse just upon co-housing. And thankfully for me, to address my concerns, uh, those non lymphoid tissues fill up with CD8 cells. And I think where this gets interesting is as follows. So we, um, you know, if you were to look at the transcriptional signatures in blood between human core blood and adult blood, and you focus on immune-related transcripts, they're actually pretty different. And we had investigated SPF mice versus pet store mice, they're also really different. And an analysis that was really enabled by a collaboration with Nick Haining, uh, there's significant overlap between these differences. And those can be, those, those are transmissible to inbred lab mice so the genetic background can be normalized. You can get rid of that variable, just change the environment, and reproduce a lot of these signatures. So transcriptionally, they're moving more in the direction of, of an adult human. And then if you were to look at certain immunological assays with different endpoints, you may get different results uh, if you compare a clean or a dirty mouse. So these are SPF mice. They've been given a uh, favorite infection of, of CD8 T cell immunologists, Listeria monocytogenes. If you look three days later, these are your, this is your bacterial burden. If you look at a co housed mouse that hasn't been immunized with Listeria, but its innate sort of resistance to this microbe appears to be very different. Uh, you've gotten a, a significant drop in those bacterial counts. This is pretty granular. I won't go into any of these markers, but you know. Me and a, a hundred other labs are studying the response to LCV, and we use this as a model uh, of T cell differentiation. And it's a great investigative tool for a lot of reasons. And we part, we subset the heck out of these cells, and we look at the different markers, and they correlate with you know, different fates and so on. If you were to take that genetically identical mouse, give it LCV, the flavors of T cells that you developed actually look different. So this is just a, a couple of vignettes to, to highlight the point that, number one, SPF husbandry is very well intentioned. I'm certainly not here arguing against it. I won't give a long speech about it, but it makes possible a lot of the things that we do. Um, Germ-free has been an interesting model that over, you know, has gained traction over the last decade or two, which has allowed investigators to look at the other end of the spectrum in a, a microbiome-free sort of situation uh, at what the contributions are, the development of the immune system and other properties. This is the opposite end of the spectrum. The question is, you know, with dirty mice, are we paying a price for SPF mice? They're no longer sort of recapitulating certain aspects of our physiology, and our infectious history matters. Our immune system has evolved to live in a microbial world, and by looking at it in a, in a situation which really doesn't recapitulate that aspect of our biology, are we losing some sort of predictive value in terms of perturbations of the immune system. 
Are we going to get a different result in clean mice than dirty mice? And would one sort of better inform the human condition or not? So that's the debate. That's uh, an issue really for the field to decide. Uh, it's been invaluable for us in terms of investigating some aspects of T-cell migration that I think are highly relevant to human that I can't study in clean mice because they lack the right flavor of cell. Mm -hmm. um, that would be one example. We're also actually doing some tumor challenges in these mice. Uh, we're going to be looking at tumor immunotherapy, checkpoint blockade, uh, to see if, if this matters. Um, so I'll leave that there and really get back to um, TRM uh, function and motility, something that um, we've, we've been thinking about for a long time. And I'm going to focus mostly on published data as, uh, although this isn't published, but to, to, to set up something cancer-related at the end. So one thing I'll highlight, we've been doing a lot of intravital microscopy. So this is the uterus of a living mouse. Every green cell here is a virus-specific memory cell, actually, for LCMP. And so these cells are resident within the tissue, meaning they don't leave, they don't get back in the blood and then come back in. But just because they're resident doesn't mean they're, they're sessile. So they are, are putatively scanning host cells, looking for evidence of reinfection. So yeah, this is, this is going on in our bodies. What's the time scale over there? Is it yeah, the time seconds? stamp is right that's there, seconds. so that's minutes. Minutes. Yeah. So they're moving at about 10 microns a minute, which actually is you know, pretty darn fast if you're a cell. It's about what, what you'd see in a living room. Uh, and that speed varies depending on the architecture of the tissue. Are they in the vasculature or are they... So, so there are cells in the vasculature, but 99.9% .9 of the cells we're looking at are in the stroma itself. And we're focusing on the, the myometrium here. And so you can see all kinds of behaviors you, you dig deeper. So if you're in a, in a very collagen-dense environment, the cells are, are moving slower. If, uh, if you have bands of muscle, you know, those kind of exclude cells, so you'll see cells kind of running back and forth, and actually with this kind of microscopy, unless that muscle is fluorescent, you'll say, why are all the cells going back and forth in a line? And then, you know, you change your methods and you, and you can figure it out. Um, so, you, you can rust these for, for a long time. Uh, now I regret, I had a pretty long story on this that I didn't include, but uh, the, the, the question I want to focus on uh, today is what happens when you establish that memory and they actually see their cognitive energy in What do they actually do? So we established these resident memories, TRM, uh, and we're going to focus initially in the female reproductive tract, and we're going to re-challenge them in the lumen with a virus that will trigger those memory cells. Or in some cases, and this is kind of relevant for the end of the talk, we can actually recapitulate this just by taking a, a peptide from that virus, the peptide that the CD and T cell actually see in the context of MHC, put that in the lumen without an adjuvant, and also trick these cells into thinking that there's a reinfection event. These cells are, are memory cells and they've already been licensed to some degree. They've gone through various checkpoints uh, to interpret that antigen and, uh, differently. So what happens? Well, I was astonished by this. So within 48 hours, uh, you know, it looks like a swarm of bees. Uh, so the recall response has been uh, very rapid. And I'll just say there's a whole lot going on here. The more we look, the, the more uh, new things that we appreciate. So I'm not going to get into the, the story that we have in press that looks at the capacity of these cells to actually divide in situ and expand and be a little different than the way we're thinking about things in my introduction. I'm going to focus on two published stories from a, a recent MD-PhD graduate, uh, Jason Schenkel, and a few summary slides. And so, you know, the, the problem I had with resident memory for a long time is, why would you design an immune system this way? And I think there's some good answers for that. We can get into it if you want. But, but the problem it creates is you've limited your immunosurveillance of this tissue to whoever got parked there a year ago. You have all these brothers and sisters cruising by in the blood with the right specificity, but they're not participating in this frontline surveillance. So this is the only game in town if an infection breaks out. What's interesting, though, the cell, if you have a productive recognition event, well, it, we used to kind of think, or I kind of thought, you know, CD and T cells are a bit more hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's certainly true, but they do broadcast the information of recognition. You know, they have a T cell receptor that a year ago saw a peptide in the context of a dangerous infection that educated that cell to become a memory cell, to live in this compartment, and when it sees that antigen again, apparently it tells the neighborhood. So it secretes cytokines. A chemokine storm is induced within the tissue, induces vascular dresses on local blood vessels, and a 
essentially, one of the things that that accomplishes is it opens the front door. So the cells cruising by in the blood, regardless of their specificity, so they don't even need that checkpoint, will at least migrate into the tissue. And so I think this is a, a rapid way of increasing the immunosurveillance efficiency in this compartment because the cells interpreted that there's a reinfection event. So maybe this will be specific for that infection. Maybe this will be specific for a co-infection. Maybe these cells will, will be meaningless, or maybe they'll have some sort of you know, helpful bystander function. Unclear. But, and it's not that you know, in a draining lymph node, which is over here by the door, you know, if this infection breaks through and you get re-stimulation there, clearly those cells can expand, proliferate, migrate, but that's going to take time. And so this may be a way of putting a foot in the gas in terms of the immune system a little bit quicker. And it's not just a CD8 recruitment issue. Uh, when you have CD8s activated, well, they'll recruit B cells. The sort of other arm of the immune system generates antibodies, which was a, a surprise to us. Local dendritic cells in the neighborhood, these are, are what typically prime immune responses, well, they will become activated in response to CD8s recognizing their fat mutation. And natural killer cells, well, it looks like they're going to be warned maybe to get ready to go to work. So they're up regulating something called Granzyme B, which is part of their own cytolytic machine. <coughs> so our conceptualization of this, we, we sometimes think of this as a sensing and alarm function. Uh, T cell is sitting here monitoring your tissue for homeostasis. And one of those perturbations of homeostasis would be an antigen that's associated with a previously encountered pathogen. And when the cell recognizes that perturbation, it communicates that. It doesn't keep the information to itself or just kill the, the one cell presenting it, but it tells the innate and the adaptive immune system, something is going on right here. Get ready to, to go to work. Is that the same uh, resident memory cell or is there a different sort of tissue? So the turnover of resident memory varies by tissue. And when I say turnover, I mean in situ proliferation. So if you were to look at a, a canonical long-lived memory cell in the blood, every month or so it's undergoing a division. And that's <laughs> thought to be sort of critical for the survival of those cells. Resident memory is heterogeneous. We see rapid turnover or very slow turnover, depending on the anatomic compartment and whether that's related to their underlying metabolism and whether it's hypoxic or, or what have you in that different environment is unclear. The question about the longevity of resident memory and whether it's being replenished by circulating pools is, is I think, a very valid question for the field. So uh, Sati Wajay uh, at UBHC in my lab, uh, who you know, is actually chronicling at least the longevity of these populations in different tissues. Answer is beginning to come, become clear, but maybe a little too premature for me to say what it is because I'm not sure. Um, we're doing things like parabiosis to do these long-term sort of assays about whether they're being replenished by recirculating pools. People have gone out as far as 100 days. We've only done about 60. And I could say those populations seem stable and not replenished by recirculating populations within that time frame. Mm -hmm. Mice, it's hard. They don't live forever. So whether you can extrapolate that to a 60-year-old human, or is, I think uh, it's certainly unclear now. But they're pretty durable. All right. So the sensing and alarm function. I'm planting a seed uh, for the, the last story I want to present. So this is, you know, it's an idea. Don't don't attack me too hard. Uh, um, but you know, we're thinking about the biology of resident memory, and I think there's a lot of ramifications in, in some of the things I didn't show you. But how you you can have local immunity with a lot of functions, and what's the role in autoimmune disease and perpetuating that. Um, or in immunopathology. But here we're thinking about the positive, and uh, could you leverage these cells, and even the cells that we already have, that we all already have, they're, they're throughout our entire body and they're in great numbers. And can we apply them in the, in the context of tumor immunotherapy? So the, the, the initial question is, you know, when you have TILs within tumors, would a fraction of those cells actually not be tumor specific but your pre-existing memories to the ubiquitous human pathogens, because tumors are part of your body, your body's being immunosurveyed, are antiviral T cells surveying those tumors? And if so, because we know something about their biology, could they be re-stimulated with known viral epitopes, because we've all had EBV, or you know, CMV is common, or flu is common, and so we know what, what the triggers are for the T cells, if I know your haplotype, and can we reproduce this like sensing an alarm function? 
to basically overcome what may be an immunosuppressive environment within the tumor, to, to trick the tumor into thinking it's undergoing a viral infection and to trigger an immunostimulatory environment. Could you recruit circulating cells, maybe in the context of CAR cells or adaptive cell therapy, getting those to a particular spot or solid tumor? Um, or would this synergize, would this have any efficacy signal, uh, perhaps synergizing with checkpoint blockade antibody therapy? And one thing I didn't show you, we haven't published, but when you do this sort of just local peptide reactivation, as long as it's the right peptide and you have memory T cells specific for that, you greatly increase the transudation of antibody to that site. Uh, so if you were to inject you know, anti pdl one the idea is you could focus that on a site that you wanted to. You could pull that antibody into, uh, into a particular tissue. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where this goes. So the, the first order of business uh, was to look in human tumors. And so we banked on the fact that about half of all Minnesotans are HLA, A2 positive. Uh, the peptides have been defined for CMV, EBV, and flu. We were capable of making those tetramers in the lab. These are reagents that allow you to, to actually stain for those T cells that are specific for those viruses. And uh, in collaboration with, with Melissa Geller for endometrial tumors or with BioNet, uh, we've been getting, at this point, sort of nine different kinds of tumors. Uh, we've looked at a total of uh, 30 HLA, A2 positive people. 20 of those experiments were sufficiently successful to, to find virus-specific cells in the blood, to get enough cells out of the tumor to, to do the, the kinds of experiments that we wanted to do. And in those 20, uh, all 20 actually had virus-specific T cells in them. So I think this is going to be a fairly common event. So uh, this is an endometrial tumor. Uh, this is an EBV tetramer. You detect that in the blood of this patient. doesn't matter what the markers are, but these cells you know, are, are double <coughs> negative for these two markers. If you pull cells out of the tumor, well, also contains EBV specific cells. And, uh, you know, the markers of these cells look different, and that's sort of an expectation because these, the biology of these cells is different, uh, particularly if they're a resident memory cell. So, can you rebuild this system in mouse? Um, so, here we playing some tricks that, that doesn't, it's not too important. We have a mouse, we give that mouse an infection to vesicular stomatitis virus, we establish a memory. So the virus is cleared, and we come along, and now we give that mouse a melanoma, either by transplanting the 16 melanoma to the mouse, or a genetic model, uh, something called P10B RAF. It's not too important, but the, the issue is this. The mouse gets a tumor in the skin. We have, uh, you probably can't see that, but our, our virus-specific cells are in red, and there's a lot of red cells in the tumors, regardless of the model. So tumors are part of your, the body, and they're being surveyed by these pre-existing memories. Now, the question is, if we were to inject just the peptides, there's no adjuvant here, but it has to be the right peptide. So a peptide from the virus that can be recognized by these T cells. And that will essentially displace natural peptides on host MHC molecules. Uh, and is, it, is it enough to trigger these cells within the context of a tumor microenvironment? And it appears to be so. So these cells will make interferon gamma, they'll upregulate something called grand 9 d uh, So these are markers of T-cell activation. They saw their antigen, they did something about it. And as a consequence, you essentially increase the number of CD8 T-cells within two days in that tumor. And that would be the, the virus-specific cells, but also other cells as well. You would increase the number of NK cells in that tumor. And this is just the two different tumor models. Those NK cells would begin to upregulate their cytolytic machinery. So granzyme B would be uh, expressed at a higher level after T cells were activated. And your dendritic cells in the tumor have become more activated. You increase the number of dendritic cells that, that have markers such as uh, th that are associated with an, an activating DC. And interestingly, you get an increase of those cells in the training lymph node as well. They express a marker CD13 that you might interpret, we don't know this, that, that they see is actually migrated from the tumor, the site of T cell reactivation, to the draining lymph node. And, for, and it looks like a DC that would be able to stimulate the immune response. Um, and that would be a good thing because typically in the steady state of tumors that are successful, you worry about you know, being non immunogenic, inducing tolerance rather than immune stimulation. So 
you know, that interpretation of the consequence of DC activation is conjecture. But we wanted to look at whether there was any sort of efficacy signal here. And I don't know that we expected that there would be. What we're doing here is you have a memory to a virus. You give a mouse a tumor that has no relationship with that virus. There's no shared antigen here. And that tumor grows, and it's a, in this case, a B16, very rapidly growing. That mouse is going to die uh, quickly. It's not you know, a, a great recapitulation of, a, of the growth kinetics in a human. Um, but postdocs only spend so much time in the lab. So, uh, <laughs> we're simply putting a peptide into that tumor, and if we had a pre-existing viral memory and we choose the right peptide, what would happen? So, this would be like a, our control peptide, which doesn't do anything, and you can see how rapidly, this is actually days, that this tumor grows out, and these mice have to be sacrificed. If you were to give, basically, if you wait for that tumor to become palpable, you give two peptide injections 48 hours apart and then walk away. So here's where our tumor has been growing. Uh, now it's palpable. We give our two <coughs> peptide injections. And the tumor basically, at least the growth kinetics, pause uh, or takes a hit, but it comes back. So we've done a lot more than, than we expected. Uh, I didn't know that we expected anything to happen. Um, but clearly we haven't cured any mice of, of a B16 melanoma. So and this is a survival, so we prolong the survival curve. So the question would this synergize with a pre-existing immunotherapy? Uh, so we went with anti-PDL1. So again, our tumor is palpable. Uh, B16 is, is not responsive to PDL1. Um, and we give our peptide, and then we give three shots of PDL1. So again, B16, B16 plus PDL1, not a whole lot different. If we give our peptide, you know, we get an effect, but uh, we just prolong survival. But if we add the PDL1, so about a third of our mice are surviving. So a few mice are being culled out here because the tumors, they, they have to, or the tumor ulcerates essentially. Um, so that's why this sort of looks as impressive as it does. But at the end of the day, a third of our mice have to get 100% clearance. And then if you were to come back, uh, you know, several months later, and not induce any new therapy. So you're not reactivating any T cells intentionally. There's no peptide, there's no PDL1. And you were to just give that same tumor at a different site and ask, has any anti tumor immunity been established? It looks like it has. So, so these mice become resistant to the no tumor challenges. So it's a weak model of you know, metastasis or whether this would have effects on abscopal tumors. I don't truly know the answer. This is our, our, our initial attempt. We we're trying to model that uh, in, in other ways that will be even more stringent. It's a work in progress, and we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, but what I've uh, sort of argued here, again, it was this sort of a different idea. The idea is thinking this is a, a different lane of immunotherapy that can be compatible with the other things that, that our people are thinking about and have shown some exciting uh, success within the clinic. Uh, but we're just using antiviral peptides. They're common, uh, so we don't have to identify new antigens here. We take the peptides that are already in the literature that everyone has immune responses to. Uh, no adjuvant, we don't have to vaccinate people, use the memories you already have uh, to promote immunostimulatory environment, to synergize, uh, hopefully with uh, other, other immunotherapy uh, modalities, and uh, in the hopes that we're gonna establish, trigger basically a, a broader anti-tumor response as well that perhaps could, could survey the, the body more broadly. And so I'll uh, end there and just thank the, the many people who did the work. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, dirty mice and intravital microscopy, that's uh, the Leap Bureau with uh, uh, Steve Jamison's been a collaborator, has Sarah Hamilton uh, and Viva, and uh, Liz Jason Schenkel and Elizabeth Steiner has done a lot of the resident memory work and all the tumor work is being done by Pam Rosato. Uh, with help with Melissa Geller, Paul Drifka, and then we've started to look at CAR T cell recruitment with Bruce Blazer and Chris Pinnell. That's work in, in progress uh, that I didn't show. And uh, thanks very much. Yeah, please. Thank you. It's, uh, it's quite stimulating. I was particularly interested uh, in your comment about 
uh, resident's memory in myometrium because uh, we do myometrium every day and, and myometrium to us is not particularly tissue that is vulnerable to infection. Um, who goes to myometrium? So the, 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 if there is uh, any risk of antigenic stimulation to the myometrium, it would be from the intermediate trophoblast, which is uh, antigenically different from uh, mom. Um, so, and then we see these guys all the time, intermediate trophoblast invade into the myometrium, so around blood vessels, and we see a lot of inflammatory response to them. Uh, we just took it for granted that these were uh, I, I don't know what we are thinking, we just see them. But if, correct me if I'm wrong, what I understood from you is that probably resident memory cells in the uh, myometrium, as you showed that slide, open the gate for similar, and I, and I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think there was a similar, uh, because mom hasn't been exposed to baby's antigens before, or this particular baby. Uh, but these are other inflammatory cells that were just invited by uh, the trigger? Yeah, so, so the first comment I'll make is that the distribution of memory, resident memory, appears to be very broad. Um, and that's true for our sort of model infections we do in mice. You know, of course we see cells in, in humans, and I think there's a, you know, you, you've seen it, I'm sure, you see lymphoid aggregates, you see clusters of T cells. Sometimes in the literature, they've been in the path books, you know, for 50 years, referred to as, you know, inflammation, but but they are you know in a very high frequency of individuals. And so I think it's a normal feature. If you go to a pet shop mouse, so you know I showed a picture from an SBF mouse in a human. If you go to mice that uh, are living in a real dirty environment, the number of T cells within that tissue is, is somewhat astonishing. And I, and that's a steady state sort of phenomenon. So how much New recruitment, does that represent how much durable resonance where you're actually looking at a cell? And it's something I didn't get into, but if you interrogate the phenotypes of these cells, so for instance, they're expressing CD69. In the past, we inferred this to be a marker of recent T cell stimulation. So it looked like a recently activated effector. Resident memory durably maintained this, so they're masquerading as effectors. They maintain cytolytic capacity, which again, Typically, we used to interpret as a marker of, I just saw my antigen yesterday, these cells are in a stable differentiation state. So I think that, yes, a lot of these cells may look like effectors, looks like something's going on, but can be just durable memories. When you get into pregnancy, and that's not something that I myself have explored, a lot of things go on in that tissue in terms of remodeling and immunologically to preserve sort of fetal tolerance that I think we're, we don't have a, a full grasp of. Uh, so a comment and a question. So a comment. Uh, a woman I went to high school with uh, got a high-grade glioblastoma, multiforme, went down to Duke and wound up on 60 Minutes because she should have been dead in months. She was injected with measles virus. Yeah. So you appear to have explained, and she was alive seven or eight years yep. later. I don't know if she still does. Is but um, it seems like you have a mechanistic explanation yeah. for that phenomenon, which no one understood. Yeah, so, so it's a, it, 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 that is a potential parallel here. So I don't know if that's the mechanistic yeah. explanation, but I think it definitely could be the mechanistic explanation. So then the question is, um, what does the field know, either in mouse or humans, relative to immune senescence and resident T yeah. cell memory cells? Because yep. there's so much cancer and aging, et cetera. Yep. Is that playing a role? Yeah, great question. So it's unclear if it's playing a role. I mean, frankly, the durability of resident memory still hasn't been established completely. I can say I've immunized a monkey and look 300 days later and I have a lot of resident memory cells. Um, but in terms of like, you know, certainly not longitudinal studies in humans, even cross-sectional to like a, a smallpox vaccine where you're hopefully not getting re-stimulated, you know, no one has done any kind of uh, study that would inform longevity completely. In terms of senescence, I think the field thinks it knows a lot of things that it doesn't. So the old sort of uh, paradigm would be these cells are masquerading as effectors. Effectors don't have any current sort of proliferation capacity, so therefore these cells don't proliferate. They're frontline army that is triggered to activate quickly, but if you need any proliferation, you have to wait for somebody in the lymph node to get involved. And the story that we have in press right now, I 
It's really actually not true. So these cells do have the capacity to proliferate. It may vary depending on your location or your own immune experience for that T cell. Uh, but clearly in the female reproductive tract or the skin, these cells actually can dominate a recall response and very much autonomously lead to their own population amplification. You can boost that population and they can increase the, the local magnitude of immune surveillance without participation from the rest of the body, which for me is a game changer in terms of how I think about immunotherapies that block T cells when they're doing bad things and migration, blocking migration won't be the only answer. I have a uh, question and a comment. Um, allergists have long talked about the hygiene hypothesis. And my question is, would human beings be better off and improved if we expose them to low pathogenic bacteria and viruses outside of the standard vaccine pro pro program? Would we be better off as humans if we did this uh, to infants? And, and my comment is, we have long used a, an immunotherapy somewhat similar to what you're talking about, and that is the BCG treatment for bladder cancer. Would, would you comment a little bit more on that? Sure. So the first question I'd love to just avoid completely. You know, <laughs> <laughs> don't get the IRP. Don't get the IRP. <laughs> you know, that, that's loaded. So, you know, I think... Uh, I think there's a capacity to learn more about the hygiene hypothesis. I know Steve Jameson's doing a little bit in the mouse model of, of asthma. Um, you know, there's a lot of clinical data out there. Everything's going to be a double-edged sword in terms of making us dirty. So uh, I don't know. We have evolved to live in a microbial world, and I do think that. And so if we could recapitulate some of that experience in a safe way, maybe that would be better. Um, it, yes, in terms of BCG. So. And I'm not familiar with all the details. You know, if you don't have uh, TB experience and if that BCG is not introducing a, a cross-reactive recall response, then conceptually it wouldn't actually be related to what I presented. What I presented is predicated on re-stimulating the memories that you right. already have. So BCG is a complex entity and it contains a lot of microbial products which are going to hit other aspects of the immune system, including sort of the innate uh, receptors that are going to induce inflammation or stimulation. So the concept I'm advocating is, is related to that, but I'm trying to do it in a very different way, in a way that doesn't require microbial products, that is tapping into T cells, so your adaptive immunity, which I look at as far more potent. So a T cell that is a memory cell has gone through checkpoints, it's been licensed, and now a very sensitive T cell receptor to a small amount of antigen is hardwired to rather potent effector functions. So if, if you know, a single molecule of LPS were to cause this kind of huge, huge focal response, we'd be, that would be bad for us because, again, we live in a microbial world. So we're tricking just the component, the specific component of the immune system that interprets just a peptide to say this, this is something worth responding to because in, two years ago it necessitated the induction of a full-blown adaptive immune response. It wasn't the 99% the of microbes that, that can just be crushed by the innate immune system. So for that reason, it's a little different than, a, the, than the BCG. Yeah. I have a question about your tumor re-challenge experiment. Yeah. So did you inject the, the B16 IV? So did you prevent lung metastasis, or was this a local injection? So this was a local. Okay. So I would love to talk to you more about, we have some ideas about how to, all the different permutations we could explore in terms of the rechallenge, and I'd love to prioritize them. Uh, we have one that we're going to start next week, where we're just going to give it in the opposite flank, just after we start the peptide therapy on the other flank. Yeah. So they're more contemporaneous. Yeah. It's a you know B16 model, so yeah, fast. Yeah. Uh, um, we hadn't considered the IV challenge, but that's. Yeah, I was wondering about systemic, you know, versus. Yeah, local. that's that's a good idea though. And then the second question has to do with. Um, can you make a T resident memory cell in vitro? And I'm thinking about CAR cells. Yeah. Because, you know, the, people are playing all sorts of different games at the genetic and biochemical levels to um, predispose them to becoming a central memory type because yep. that's got better. Yep. So I know you said that there are different tissue, you know, yeah. resident signals, and I guess the field is not mature enough 
That's correct. So a lot of people are starting to ask that question. Uh, you know, TGF beta is known to drive CD13, which is on a subset of DRM, but really isn't the lineage defining uh, extrinsic factor. We had identified some putative factors, uh, IL33 and TNF alpha, in, in conjunction with TGF beta, as a, what can happen in a petri dish type experiments. The challenge is going to be not only inducing the, the differentiation program, but still getting the cells to the right place. Uh, I could also argue that if you get the right cells to the right place, the tissue itself will take care of the DRM program. Um, so you just can't over-differentiate your cells down a lineage pathway that is refractory to those signals. Two questions. Um, and I missed it. What are they targeting in the tumor once you've immunized with the viral pet? Are these cells just coming in and yeah, whacking the tumor? Or? Very good question. So I don't know mechanism yet. No, that's the, the sort of phase two of this project. So I could speculate on a few things. So one is you get some effect if you just hit with anti-CD3. It's not nearly as good of an effect. So maybe that's not optimal CD3. But that would suggest that there's some effect of just T-cell activation itself. Okay. What I can exclude and what I suspect is a part of this is you're getting some degree of direct presentation. So this is, again, speculation. You put the peptide in the environment, you're going to get some. So peptides are not covalently linked to the MHC class 1 molecules. You have an on-off rate. You're going to replace some of the, the, the tumors endogenous engines now, now with a viral peptide. And I, I wonder if you aren't getting sort of T-cell direct recognition of the tumor. But I don't know. Oh, thank you. So, and a question I often ask immunologists. So these high CD44 memory cells, is there a functional role for the CD44 on these cells? Or, yeah. or do they become... Are they amnesia uh, yeah. when you remove the CD44? Yeah. So, so if you now got CD44, people have struggled a, a long time in identifying great functions. There's a literature there, and there's some, you know, a little bit of role in T cell development, whether it's true or not. But, but there's something out there on that. So, I, I should present this other story. So, so we uh, have an unpublished story where, you know, for many years we know that T cells get into tissue by migrating out of blood. That's the canon, and that's certainly not wrong. We have identified a different pathway of T cell immune surveillance. And so T cells normally go actually through the perineal cavity. So they're in the blood, they get out there, and then they leave and they get back into the blood, which never made any sense to me. And I, I not a bright guy, I wasn't even sure what the, it looked like outer space to be perineal cavity if you're a T cell. So I think they're crawling along the visceral organs. And what we found is if, if an organ becomes infected, those T cells have mainline entry into that tissue right there. And that appears to be CD44 dependent. So this binds hyaluron. So I think when you have a sort of, you know, that becomes exposed in an infected tissue on the surface, that can be a mechanism to really broaden your immune surveillance by using an alternative mechanism. So do the cells go into hyaluron and rich tissues like, that is like cartilage our, or, or vitreous or? That, that's a good question that I, at least I don't know the answer okay, to. So. But. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, sure. First answer I've got. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks uh, very much, everyone.